Talk a lot of college ball on this show, D2, D3, NAIA specifically. Where do those guys come from? Well, the transfer portal has obviously been a big piece of that, but typically speaking, the high school recruiting process and someone I've brought on to talk about that process and some of the guys playing in the big matchups this coming weekend, founder of Aaron is Stan Fedrosi. What's going on? Kobe, great to have uh, me on. I appreciate it very much. Uh, enjoy talking to you again, man. You were, you were obviously an instrumental player in my career, one of my last few recruits before I got out of college coaching. And, man, you've done a great job. So I'm excited to come on and talk about playoff college football, man. There's nothing better. There isn't. And uh, we've got a lot of teams, you know, fortunately for us, that are still doing some of the homegrown kind of recruiting. And we see, obviously, less and less of that and potentially in college football as as we move along. And there are some guys, though, that we'll talk about today that are certainly question marks and the fact that, you know, uh, maybe a hometown kid that didn't get recruited by said squad. And talking about some of the reasons, maybe from a perspective of yours, where you've been, you know, inside of the college coaching at a bunch of different institutions and now being on the outside and trying to help those recruits and those prospective, prospective student-athletes excuse me, manage and navigate that process, I think is is valuable insight. So we'll start with one that I'm sure many are familiar with. And we've got Grand Valley State and Harding squaring off this weekend. And the matchup this past week against UIndy was one that was incredibly back and forth. I know you had it in the notes, an old school GLIAC matchup. Talk to me about that one and kind of tee it up as far as uh, you had a guy singled out that we wanted to, to break down and discuss. Yeah, first off, getting a chance to see Grand Valley and Indy go back and forth, brought me back to 10, 15 years ago when I was first off coaching at Grand Valley. But, mm-hmm. you know, even before I used to play against Indy, it was kind of great to see that matchup. You know, those are, Indy was always such a phenomenal team and they've obviously continued their tradition, but have to go up to Lubbers is just challenging in the playoffs. Obviously, Grand Valley has been one of the stalwarts for the, for ever since I can remember in my career of college athletics since even before coach Kelly was there Mm -hmm. and to see them match up and, you know, Grand Valley obviously got the better of them and the score maybe doesn't reflect how tough of a game it was as I was doing a little bit of work here to see somebody give Grand Valley so many challenges rushing the football. um, I don't know if I've seen that in a long time outside of a Ferris matchup, even some of the great Saginaw Valley teams I played on and coached on, we weren't able to limit them in that kind of a rushing capacity. So I give you Indy a lot of credit for their ability to go up there. And, uh, you know, obviously they fell a little bit short, but th- that was probably a slug slug fest. I would have loved to have seen that in person. It was, and it was, you know, you talk about 7 nothing going into halftime Grand Valley, and the UIndy, that Greyhound defense, had played really, really well. There was one lapse, and it was the deep touchdown pass. It's Kellen Reed, and then you go into the next one, and it was, again, one deep touchdown pass, and it's, you know, 14 nothing, and you would think maybe a one-sided contest, it was really everything but two plays for that that Greyhound defense. And um, soak up scores, scores and runs one in at the quarterback spot there. Grand Valley kind of takes it and runs away with it towards the end. Finally woke up, but uh, playing with your food is not going to – it's not really a strategy to win in the playoffs. So we'll see about – we'll talk about Harding here in a little bit. But a tight end that's been an impact player for them and Gavin. Talk about him uh, out of Greenville. Yeah, Gavin uh, Casso, I believe his last name is. I remember him watching his film as a high school player, and just the length and the physicality was really impressive. And he's obviously carried that over to Grand Valley, which, again, was so surprising that they weren't able to kind of dominate the rushing side of the game. But somebody like that and the whole line they've always put together. But you're talking about a player even in high school who had that great length was able to move people off the ball out in the C and D gap. And this is a kid that's going to play a huge instrumental role moving forward. You see the growth. I mean, anytime you have the length, I mean, this is a 6'6 player that's got frame and can can be able to get into their strength and conditioning program and really blossom and take off. But he's going to be critical in the passing game. I know he only had one catch this past week. I think it was for about 22 yards. These are the type of games moving forward, both that indie game and maybe moving forward, depending how much longer they play, that he is going to be key. Because if you're struggling to run the ball, having that outlet at the tight end position, and you saw him do it in high school, you'd see him split out and just kind of run a little hook route and and the quarterback would just dump him the ball. That is so big in the playoffs. You know, when you are just kind of trying to bear down and just, again, trying to eke out a victory, sometimes those small little gains to a kid like this can just be impactful. And I think I see that coming to fruition as, as the playoffs roll on. And you could see it even when he's coming out of high school. But I think he's really going to take off from here. That would be my biggest prediction that he's going to be a kid to watch uh, this upcoming weekend. 
I believe that. And coming out of high school, when you talk about a guy that, you know, listed at 6'6", 225, fresh out of high school. And that is a frame that usually fields a lot of national attention, right? And I think in that the greater, whether it's Metro Detroit or the west side of the state, any kind of lower Michigan, there's a lot of guys in that boat where Grand Valley is, you're talking about max schools, 1A, 1B, and Grand Valley seems to be right on that tier with those guys. And they, quote, unquote, steal a couple of these guys that have maybe the measurables and some of these other, you know, intangibles that feel like uh, from a lot of people from the outside perspective think that guy, he didn't go to play at the division one level. And that's where I think Grand Valley is in, in such a unique spot where they obviously have this large campus, this big game atmosphere. How often do you see that with guys like Gavin that, um, you know, again, from an outside perspective feels like probably should be playing at a larger institution. Well, the question for a player like him coming out of high school was how athletic can he be? And again, how impactful can he be in the pass game? And I'm yeah. sure that's where a lot of people had questions because what you saw years ago was this direction with the tight ends wanting to be a big part of the pass game. You see the George Kittles of the world. You see the Kelsey's of the world. And maybe those are bad examples because those are, are the top one percenters. Mm -hmm. But people always want to steal some of those ideas and use those in a lot of the same capacities. But I'm sure people had questions about how athletic was he going to be. Heck, I'm sure some of the bigger schools even thought, could he move into tackle? Which that's where a lot of Mac schools had had success, but at a Grand Valley and now also at a Ferris, you get a chance to play in those big game environments. Almost week in and week out in Grand Valley, you're playing in that matchup against Ferris, you're even playing in that matchup against Saginaw Valley, you're still playing in these huge environments. And no disrespect to Maction, but there ain't a lot of people in those games on a Tuesday evening. So kids think about that. And they think about what I can do to still have the opportunity to win and be successful to go along with it, to compete for national titles, which you just don't get at some of those kind of tweener schools with these yeah. recruits that are kind of right on that line you kind of get the best of both worlds. For, so for a kid like this, I'm sure there was a lot of question. Could he move into left tackle? Does he have the athleticism to grow and do what we want with him at tight end? And Grand Valley took him and said, let's put him in his natural position. Let's let him dominate the line of scrimmage and have a little bit of a role in the pass game. But I still think he's going to be even bigger moving forward in the pass game for this uh, Grand Valley team. Absolutely. And you talk about even at the D2 level, the developmental program the Lakers have, he put on 25 pounds from year one to year two and grew into that frame and has been an impact player for them kind of ever since. And now from 2019 to now, you look at the strides that he and a lot of others that, you know, inside of that class have made. But looking forward to this weekend, they take on Harding and the Veer. And I know um, there's, you know, not many Michigan products over on that squad. And, and this one was certainly more of a surprise to me. But talk about talk about Ben over there for the Bisons. Yeah, so this is a really unique story because I think the matchup between Harding and Grand Valley is, first off, two unbelievable football teams, mm -hmm. but really in a lot of ways are kind of polar opposites in how they approach building their program. Grand Valley has probably some of the premier facilities, at, at least at the Division II level. A lot of people are raising their game and matching yeah. them. You know, they can pull from a really strong level of Midwest talent. You can dive into Ohio. You can dive into Indiana. Heck, you can go get over into Chicago, which they do a really good job of. They even dabble up here in Wisconsin as well. But Harding has some really unique challenges to their school. It's beautiful. I've stepped foot on their campus. Their facilities have been upgraded really in the last five, six, seven years. So there's not this huge disparity in that. But the difference is in what they recruit, and they will literally go anywhere. They will scour the country to find the right fit for Harding. And they found a kid, Ben Bame, out of Hamilton High School, right down the road from Grand Valley. Mm -hmm. And he just wasn't quite the fit for what a Grand Valley or even a fair is. We're not just going to throw stones at Grand Valley here who, who potentially maybe missed him. But you're talking about all these schools in the GLIAC that said, you know what? He's an extremely fast player. He's got some explosiveness, but maybe he doesn't have quite that wiggle that a lot of people want to see at the running back position. Well, here's Harding a team that was on the prowl to go win the national title last year. They reached out to his coach. They realized it was a great fit, both from a personality, a culture standpoint for what he was looking for. And then he really fits strong into that offense. Now he's being redshirted this year, but I think that tells the story of a Harding program that does it differently than a Grand Valley who has so many opportunities from a talent standpoint coming their way. They might actually be sifting through so much talent like a Gavin, like an Ian Canelli out of Eisenhower High School, where a Harding has to go scour and find the right kid for their offense and right kid for their school and university. I just think it's, it's going to really be a compelling matchup. And again, I'm excited to see Ben and him grow within the Harding program for years to come because he's going to be an excellent fit for that Veer offense. 
And you talk about, I think, when you look at the D2 level, there are some more of those quote-unquote niche schools. Now, whether it's a niche school because of play style, like Harding, not everyone goes and fits into that, the flex bone uh, type of offense. Whether it's academically kind of a niche, whether it's a, you know, a technological school like Michigan Tech or Colorado School of Mines that are very focused in some of their curriculars, whether it's a culture fit, there are a lot of these things where guys where, like you said, they may be across the country, but they would be a perfect fit on this team in this locker room for that campus and that fit. How do you advise people go out and find that fit? Because obviously people from Michigan, Harding is not on the top of your list. It's not even in the right. middle of your list. How do you go out and cultivate those kind of connections? And is there a better way or a best way to do your research and try and find out what might fit for you know any prospective student athlete? Well, what's really cool right now in the digital recruiting world is you can kind of find any program as a family, as a high school coach at, at your fingertips, right? Pull up your phone, search out the school a little bit, get you can find out who the coaches are in less than 10 minutes. But what it really comes down to is what's important for that kid and that family. When you start talking about Division II, Division III, NAIA, and you start talking about all the different components that come along with it, you made a great point. Niche schools in many cases, partial scholarships in almost every case. You really have to make sure that it's what you want. You can't just throw a dart at a dartboard at this level. You really have to sit mm -hmm. down consolidate with your family on what is important to you. For some people, distance isn't a big issue. For Ben going down to Harding, Arkansas, not an issue. He was okay with the distance. It was a really good fit for him. Some people struggle to go two hours away. Some people struggle to go from the west side of Michigan to Detroit and play at Wayne State from a distance standpoint. Yeah. Some thrive. I really think it's critical that you sit down as a family and discuss a lot of these things, then talk to your high school coach and let them kind of just start hammering out that network. Let them start making those connections because they're going to be the ones that have to advocate for the kid because the coaches at, at these programs are thinking the same thing. I'm sure when coach Middleton down at Harding heard the coaches call down and say, Hey, we got this kid out of, you know, coming here out of Michigan. I'm sure they thought to themselves, well, why, you know, are we sure this is going to be a fit for us? Is this just a kid that's reaching kid coming from Hamilton, Michigan is not going to be common yeah. for them. So it really takes time for the two to find their fit. And it starts with the family and the players saying, what do I truly want out of this? And then go talk to your high school coach and start attacking that process. And you'll find a really good fit. And these are great examples. Yeah, because the best the best schools will go out and they'll find those guys. And if it's a right. good fit for them, they'll bring them in. And Harding's a squad that, you know, Coach Simmons and company down there, they recruit Arkansas heavy. They have a lot of guys yeah. right there from in there in Searcy. And they bring those guys in and, and cultivate that group. A lot of those guys have played together for a number of years. But to your point, if there are guys that fit the mold and fit that culture the Bison have down there, they'll go out of the way to – to get them down. Now, to close the chapter on, on GV in front of a game that, um, you know, you'd written down that could define kind of the Scott Wooster era here at GV and how far they can make this push into the playoffs with this specific squad, a big part of that push is Ian Canelli, a guy that has been a staple of that defensive secondary for Grand Valley. Talk about him and his process coming out of high school. Yeah, Utica Eisenhower's always produced some great football players. I got a chance to play with what I would consider one of the best, John DiGiorgio. Uh, had an unbelievable career for us, was an All-American. In my opinion, should have won the Harlan Hill his senior year uh, and then went on to an NFL career. And they've always produced high-caliber players because of the level of competition. First off, when you're playing in the MAC, but then you get a chance to go into the playoffs, you're going to run into Cass Text. You're going to run into some of the best programs in the state. And I think Ian was just another one of those products that came through extremely long, extremely talented, maybe slightly overlooked from a standpoint of top end speed. And the thing that was really unique when I went back, I had a chance to recruit Ian. I knew his uncle, so I had a chance to recruit him and, and I had a good relationship with him. But when I went back and reviewed some of the film, his play in the MHSFCA All-Star Game was incredible at receiver. Yeah. This is a long player, unbelievable ball skills that went out and dominated that game, in my opinion, and now is turned into one of the premier safeties at Grand Valley, which that role at Grand Valley has probably been almost as critical as the quarterback role. I mean, mm -hmm. the quarterback position at Grand Valley is, in my opinion, there, there's very few that can rival it, except for what Ferris is doing right now. Okay, but it's just incredible. The Kurt Ains, Colin Finnerty, the players that they've run through that program. But the safety position has is, is just been as dominant in many ways. And this week when you're playing a flex bone team, that team coming up from Searcy is going to run the football, run the football, run the football, run the football. And they might throw it two or three times. And those three throws are critical. But Ian is a player that shows the athletic ability. And I even watch it again from his high school time to be able to play the run, play the run, show up into that C gap be able to find a way to fit and play the pitch, but then still sit back on that one post. He's athletic enough. He's able to do, I think it's going to be a huge matchup 
from Ian and the rest of the defensive backs at Grand Valley. It's always been such a, a position of strength. But at the end of the day, to be able to play that style for 60 minutes, to be able to lock it into the run, but you cannot miss on that one big pass. Yeah. He's got the skill set to do it. You can see it even in high school. So I'm excited to see the impact he's going to make in that part of the game. Yeah, and we've had their quarterback, Cole Keelan, on the show, who is an awesome dude and admittedly does not throw the ball very often. When he does, usually it does a lot of damage because you set them up uh, in, in that kind of way. And you talk about from the safety position, you need a guy that's able to come in there and put his body on the line and fill the hole because when Keelan becomes the ball carrier himself – now you're down a man, so to speak, on yep. defense because you have to account for that quarterback being the ball carrier gets an extra blocker or two in front of them, whether that's Dela Cruz or Brayton Jay or Jalen Spicer yep. and those kind of guys in that offensive backfield there for Harding. And if you don't have a guy like, you know, who's going to go in there and fill a hole and, you know, be gap responsible and it's got that scheme, you're in trouble. And it's going to be yep. a very long day because Harding, the, the thing that they do is they figure out where you're weak and they are going to expose that the entire, you know, 60 yep. minutes of the contest, whatever that is. So uh, let's move over to another GLIAC dominant force that has been in Ferris State. And Trinidad Chambliss is a guy that maybe didn't really know exactly what his role was going to be coming into this year. Ferris has run a two-quarterback system, but with Golker going down in week one with a leg injury, he has become the focal point of this Ferris State offense, and he's blossomed into that role, I mean, incredibly well. And I was impressed with him in his athletic ability last year, but I think physically he looks like an entirely com completely different person this year, and I think he's taken ownership you know, vocally and through his play of this Ferris state offense yeah it's really it's an unbelievable story again i just touched on it when you think about some of the play in the gliac over the last 10 you even go maybe go back 20 years you go back to the coach kelly era and even our time at saginaw valley the quarterback play is always going to drive how good your team is there's no doubt about that wayne state went on a, a national championship running back in 2011 with a really good quarterback we had some great quarterbacks matt lafleur was our quarterback and led one of the greatest comebacks in college football history in the playoffs against iup Grand Valley goes without saying, but what Ferris has done is, is, is unbelievable. I got to give Coach Anise a lot of credit and his ability to not only develop, because I think people are going to talk about that when you think about what Jason Vanderlaan did, but now to, yep. to talk a little bit about what Trinidad has been able to do when you watch his film from high school, super athletic. And I can understand why maybe some people didn't know what to do with him or where he would develop and project in time. He's playing receiver at, sometimes in his sophomore year. He's also already starting to get back at quarterback and just the athleticism, but you can see him throw the ball. It's not big. He's not your prototypical pocket passer, but these are the type of players that Coach Anise has taken, that entire offensive staff and that entire offensive scheme, and they fit in perfectly. Now, he's not Jason Vanderlaan by any means. Jason no. is 250 pounds. Very, very so different much. side of the spectrum. Very different side of the spectrum, but his impact in the playoffs, I think, will be very similar because okay. you have to play them almost in a similar capacity where you have to defend the run, but yeah. it's different. He's going to be more out in space, right? Yeah. So you're going to see this kid from Forest Hills Northern that maybe was overlooked, but comes in and now you have to focus your entire 11 on defense on him, but he has the ability to throw maybe slightly better than Jason, just from a natural ability standpoint, when you go mm. back and you watch his film. And like you said, you watch his growth, his ability to throw the ball is pretty darn special. He just doesn't have that massive size. Jason had to really develop his throwing skill set, and it was unbelievable, the growth that he had. I think this Trinidad's natural ability, you can see it back in high school. I think just that chip on his shoulder that he's carried, you saw him talk about it after the Grand Valley game, that he felt like that meant a little bit more. I see him playing like that too. And these are the type of kids that Coach Anise has been able to take from high school plug in and kind of continue to drive that juice and that energy. It's unbelievable to see. He's going to be so big moving forward. And it's a lot of pressure on him, but I think he's prepared for it. Again, not a Jason Vanderlaan type player from that same spectrum. Man, he's got some similarities on a defensive standpoint of how you have to defend against him. Good luck to whoever's, you know, kind of scheming that team up this week. Agreed there, and we'll stay with Ferris State before we finish off with some WIAC talk over there um, in Wisconsin. And a guy that, you know, has made a pretty big lateral move, quote-unquote, in Victor Nelson at the defensive line position for Ferris. And he was just a dominant force for that Saginaw Valley defensive front. And like I said, makes that quote-unquote lateral move, which, you know, you could argue that was kind of an upward swinging move, depending on, you know, where you look at it in Saginaw's positioning in the GLIAC, because Ferris has been this national power. And so when you come to Ferris, you can expect a couple things. And one of those things is that you're probably going to be playing playoff football. You're going to get some film against top caliber opponents. And that's a great selling point for guys like Victor who are coming out of the portal and probably want to get some great tape out there to, you know, play it potentially at the next level. But talk about uh, Nelson always be able to do for Ferris. 
Well, I mean, again, I'm, I love high school recruiting, but the portal is absolutely part of it. And these are opportunities for kids to take advantage of what they feel is best for them. And I remember recruiting victories and part of my last recruiting class when I was still there on the staff and coming out of Detroit Central High School, probably not one of the premier recruited programs, but this was one of the bigger, stronger, more physical players that I remember recruiting in all my years of coaching college football, but just undersized. And these are the type of players that you're going to see every Saturday when you go to a Division II, Division III football game, especially yeah. in the playoffs. Maybe slightly undersized, but the power and explosiveness that Victor maintained, obviously from a physical standpoint. This is what, again, was so good at Saginaw Valley, but Ferris has dominated with that. And when you go into the playoffs, we touched on it. You know, they might not be playing the flex bone uh, against Harding this week as they're playing Central uh, Oklahoma, but the reality is you're going to have to run the football in playoff uh November, December games. So this is a kid that can not only hold his gap, possibly two gap, and shows the explosiveness to get off and just kind of discombobulate your offense from a running standpoint. And I just don't think he's going to be first off overlooking this game, potentially looking at a Grand Valley rematch. I don't think the moment's going to be too big for him. I don't think the Ferris moment is going to be too big for him from a yeah. standpoint of their expectations. But a kid coming out of Detroit to be able to have a chance at Detroit Central to be able to come out and have a chance to go compete for a national title, you can probably see and understand why he wanted to make that move and kind of give himself that chance. I think he's going to take it, and I think he's going to run with it. I think he's, been, he's going to be one of the premier defensive linemen in the playoffs. And he's fit into their their scheme. I mean, that yep. Ferris defensive, you know, that down four or whatever it is, they have been so disruptive, and it becomes just suffocating for, you know, opposing offenses. And on the other side of things, the Broncos, who obviously – Overtime thriller against Wachita on Saturday was just absolutely ridiculous. Um, a player that you wanted to talk about in this one, and Jonathan Mosley. I mean, talk to me about his impact for that UCO team coming out of the MIAA and having what really is an historic season for them, the first time they won a playoff game in, I believe, 25 years. Yeah, I mean, the MIAA is just an incredible Division II league. And obviously, being here in Wisconsin, you get a chance to be close to some of the programs in this direction. And you see, I think, a standpoint of physicality that is – very mirrored to the GLIAC. You don't really see a whole lot of a difference from a dis disparity standpoint from what you're seeing in the GLIAC week in and week out. I think the GLIAC might have just a little bit more speed. And I think when you consider what he's been able to do at the safety position, you're talking about a player that came from one of the premier programs in Oklahoma. They've had 18 state championships. So Jonathan Mobley is not going to be overwhelmed by the moment that they've had this overtime thriller kind of rising this program up. You know, Central Oklahoma has always kind of been there. I always remember following UCO a little bit, but seeing their growth and seeing them in this position, that safety position, again, is just so critical in the playoffs. A player with this kind of physicality, and you can see it in high school, you can see the physicality had. Again, I think the, the thing that you might have been missing maybe was some top-end speed that some coaches maybe were like, well, we're not sure if he's going to be able to play man-to-man. -man. Quarters coverage against some of the Big 12 at the time, or maybe even SEC players. But to be able to come to this level and show his, his physicality, this is a kid that runs the alley and can and can make one yard gains from starting at 12, 13 yards back yeah. during your play and cover two. And that's impressive to be able to show that physicality, but his range in the middle of the field in the pass game is also critical. I touched on it a little bit earlier with Gavin. You have to play the middle of the field in this time of the year, no matter where you are when you're playing against teams that throw it and run it pretty balanced. So his ability to play the middle, take away those digs by the safeties, even still carry players vertical, but run the alley and play with that physicality. Again, I'm not surprised based off what I saw from his high school film and understanding the level of competition from, again, an 18-time state championship program in Oklahoma. Mm -hmm. You just see those types of players developing, coming to fruition, and really kind of taking off at this time of the year. I think this is a kid who's going to have Really, again, another huge impact in the game, and it's really probably going to determine what Ferris has to do, uh, you know, with their offense. He's yeah. going to be a game, a game changer. And finally, over over in the WAC, one of the the better matchups. I mean, in quote unquote round two after the pseudo play in that is now right. the D three playoffs expanded to a forty field our 40 team field excuse me you've got a Platteville squad taking on Wartburg and um yes is the experience pretty lopsided a Wartburg team that sees himself on the national stage every single year it feels like after a incredible semifinal match against North Central last year and this is certainly going to be a back and forth type contest uh, contest Platteville's defense certainly needs to step up and and raise the bar here but there was a guy on the side of Platteville I know you wanted to highlight and mention 
Yeah, I mean, first off, the Platteville story is everything that's great about college football in a really a true playoff format. I mean, I've followed the WEAC for a while. I knew about it long before I moved here to Wisconsin. But this is a program that has really kind of taken this conference by storm. And there was some real volatility in this league this year with some of the crazy wins that happened. I mean, uh, lacrosse came over and gave Grand Valley a heck of a game. Oh, yeah. That shows you one score game. And that shows you just the level of competition in this league. In my opinion, this league is is probably as strong as any that I've ever seen. But for Platteville to put themselves in this position and be relatively new, you've got to be able to run the football. So to be able to see Zach, I hope I'm saying his name right, Zach Bolton from Platteville, and the growth that he's been able to have. This is, again, another really long player that actually had so many good linebacker highlights. I was wondering, you know, when I kind of reflected back on his recruiting process, would somebody have thought maybe he could play alley linebacker at a higher level because he's got length, he's got Mm -hmm. strength, he's got power. But then you actually clicked over to the running back clips about halfway through his highlight, and holy cow, did you see pretty good vision. Yeah. Did you see pretty good contact balance? And again, I can maybe see that there is maybe missing that top end at the time. But this is one this is one of those players that if he hits that development button, he's going to come in and be a really good player and take a team just like this into the playoffs. And that's exactly what he's done. 800 yards rushing at his size. It's actually been over the last two years. He's took over last year. He's done a great job running the football this year. I'm just not all that surprised to see the success he's having, but people always have questions in the recruiting process, again, on these tweeners. And this is a kid that's come in, really good vision, physicality, and he's leading this football team. And this is exactly what you need in November football to keep this train going. I think he's gonna put their team in a really good position. It's an awesome story to follow Platteville alone, but then uh, kind of diving in and following Zach and seeing what he did in high school. I can see why Platteville took a chance on him. Yeah. And he's not, not maybe not a chance. He might even been their top recruit. I can definitely see where those coaches were like, if this kid hits well, on either side of the football, he's going to be a big time player for us. And he's definitely doing it for him. And he's going to be huge this weekend. Yeah. And talk about one of the misconceptions, I think, of the D2, D3 level is guys that, okay, if I don't go D1, then I'll go and start on a D2 or D3 team. And I think a lot of people find out very early on that is not the case. You might go and get redshirted depending on where you're at, or you might be in kind of a developmental or maybe more of a role player type position. And a lot of guys don't grow into that until year two, year three, sometimes even, you know, later on. But I think that's a misconception a lot of people have coming out of high school. Well, it is. And I'll tell you what the cool thing about the transfer portal is now a lot of kids, when I was playing, Okay, back in the day, and even when I started my coaching career, would transfer down. Yeah. Right. So you might not get a chance to play because we brought in a transfer down from a Mac school. Heck, even Big Ten schools would we would get some kids in and they would be able to come in and be impact players for us. It actually goes the other way now. And here's why kids don't immediately play because the coaches at these levels are far superior than we were in my time, in my opinion. Okay. Now there's still some really good ones that are still coaching that were in my time, but they've all grown and they've all adapted and they have worked schemes, strength and conditioning to the highest level now where you're coming in and you're not beating out other high school recruits that were just one or two years ahead of you. Yeah. That's actually the really cool thing about division two, II, division three, NAIA football. When you incorporate the transfer portal, you now have to focus on development at the division two level. I talked to the coaches, coach Adams, a good friend of mine out at St. Anselm. We talked to him about it all the time, how important development is coach Postman, same thing at grand Valley. You think about some of these coaches at Ferris. I, I got a chance to play for Coach Smith and got a chance to coach Coach Caserta, who are there doing an unbelievable oh, job yeah. right now. It's the same thing. It's development. So when you come in and you maybe think, oh, well, maybe Division Two or Division Three isn't for me. I'm going to come in and start right away. You're going against kids who have been developed for the last two or three years. Again, because those gaps in your roster are being filled by players on your roster now. That's actually one of the great things about the transfer portal at this level. I agree. I agree wholeheartedly, and there's a lot of different ways that it'll shake out. But, again, you stay the course and eventually come out on top and end up, you know, being one of those guys like the guys we mentioned tonight that that really come out and be real critical pieces of those squads. But uh, I think that about wraps it up as far as the topic for tonight. So I appreciate you coming on. I think that was really good insight. And hopefully there's some, you know, little tidbits, little nuggets in there that will resonate with some people. Thanks, Kobe. I really appreciate it.